Brother, for being late. Uh, thank you for coming, and uh, 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 we would like to. Uh, it's it's a pleasure to host uh, Professor Agata Guillou, uh, who is a full professor in data science at Evry Paris uh, Sahle University. Uh, she's the head of the mathematical mathematics lab uh, at Evry Paris University, Sahle University in Paris, France. She is also having the master's degree in data science with applications in health and finance uh, of, of the same university. She received her PhD degree and two master's degrees, one in mathematical statistics and one in biostatistics and the one from Rand University in Amsterdam. She was appointed as assistant professor, then associate professor at Sorbonne University in 2005 and 2010, respectively. She then joined every Paris University as a full professor in 2016. Her research focuses on statistics and machine learning with application to, uh, applications to health, uh, clinical data sets, and public health. A significant part of her work is dedicated to large observer, uh, observational longitudinal data, especially electronic, electronic health uh, records. Both theoretical and applied aspects of her research have been published in top ranking journal and conferences. Uh, I give the floor to Professor Guy. Thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation. And ve I'm very pleased that the opportunity to um, share my research, research subject with you. So I will go fast on this slide because you told and it's almost all thing that I want. So um, I will talk about machine learning or AI. And I just say that in France is IA, so I might be <laughs> mistaken because between AI and IA. Um, so uh, most of my, my work um, is dedicated to uh, precision medicine. So what do you want to do in precision medicine? You want to develop indi individualized care. Uh, in that, in particular, you want to provide the best treatment and the best follow-up to each patient. So where ML or AI is coming into the picture is because when you want to develop a diag diagnosis tool, you have a classification task. When you want to develop a prognosis tool, you have a regression task. And when you want to develop, I will uh, come again on this part later, a uh, diagnosis. Uh, this is linked to causal inference. Okay, so all that precision medicine creation I really linked, linked to machine learning and I, AI algorithm. So I will first present the kind of data we can train our algorithm from, and then I will show some examples. Okay. If you have any question, please feel free to interrupt. So I will define this diagnosis, prognosis, and diagnostic from examples so that it's easier to understand. So for the diagnosis, um, we'll go with a colorectal cancer patient. And the, well, the clinician know that there are two subtypes of this cancer. And the subtypes determine heavily the treatment. Either you go with chemotherapy or with immunotherapy, that, that are two very different kinds of treatments. So if, if you're not given the right treatments, it's not good for you. Okay. And today, these subtypes are assessed, assessed but yeah, very expensive genomic testing. It's very expensive, very long to get, and so on. So the idea is, can we do the same uh, diagnosis from this kind of images? This is when you resect the tumor, you will cut a very thin uh, slide of it and have it uh, with a picture. So it's, it's common practice in clinics. You have, you've got that for all the, your patients. So if you can get the diagnosis from this image, you gain a lot of money and a lot of time, okay? So we can do that from the tissue from tumor resection. This has been done in 2021. And now we are looking uh, to do that 
with biopsy tissues. The biopsy will, you will have uh, a bit earlier in your patient trajectory. So it would be even better to do that from the biopsy tissue. Okay, so it's really a machine learning task because you have input data and you have to give a diagnosis or a classification. So for the prognosis, let's get almost the same um, example. So you have a cancer patient, you have feature X that can be genomics, clinical, anything. And just after tumor resection, you want to give a prognosis to this patient and you want to know which are the important features that can influence the prognosis. Uh, well, I will get to the end. Why do you want to do that? Because every cancer patient will ask you, ask you the question for how long will it, will it, how long will it, will it last till I um, will relapse from, from, the, from the cancer? And the other one, it's, uh, and it will determine the follow-up. If, if you are at risk of, of, a, of, a, of an early relapse, you want to have a very strict follow-up every six months. And if you are not at high risk of a relapse, perhaps every year or every five years will be enough. And for the second uh, thing that we want to select important feature is because for the biologists, biologist theory, they want to look to this feature and to understand the genomics and the biology of the tumor. Okay. So I will uh, speak of the time between uh, the tumor resection. So you're at this point tumor free or cancer free and till the possible relapse of your cancer. So it's a length, we call that a survival or survival time. So it's the time between these two events. And so what, what we want to do is give a prognosis, is to give a prognostic. So we want to estimate the probability that this time between the end of, the, of your first cancer and the beginning of the, your second cancer, this time will be greater than, let's say, two years or three years knowing your feature, okay? Knowing your clinical history, your, the genomic of your tumor and so on. So if I can estimate this probability, I can be, give a prognosis to my patient. I can say like, well, in two years, you have a 80% chance of being disease-free, okay? That's what he wants to hear. Okay, and the last thing, which is important in uh, precision medicine, is teranosis. It's a bit more complicated. So I consider the same patient with the same feature, and now I have two treatments, and I have to decide which treatment is the best for him or for her. So going again with the probability of being disease-free at time T, I want to know if the probability is greater under treatment one, uh, treatment zero. Okay. If the probability of being disease-free at time two is greater, so I want to go with treatment well. I think if it's the inverse, I want to go to with treatment zero. So now what I want to estimate is this probability, this, this, this uh, difference, what we call the CATE, C-A-T-E. Okay, so now I have to estimate this, but the, the the thing that is tricky is when you have one patient, it go, goes or she goes with treatment one or treatment zero, but not both. So you will either observe T1 or T0, but not both. So they, you can, from a statistical point of view, this quantity is very, you don't know just yet how you can estimate that because you will observe either T1 or T0, but not both for the same person, okay? So that's, there, that is where causal inference comes into the picture, and I will finish my talk with this. Okay, so this is for precision medicine, but in, in health application in general, there are 
related questions. So I will talk about pharmacovigilance. So uh, when a drug is um, is given in a general population, it can some kind of adverse event can appear. So we want to detect them very fast. Um, there are some administ administrative questions. So first, if, if you if you're in a hospital, if you work in your hospital, you want to know you want to know how long this patient is going to stay in this room, just to organize this, the service. Yeah. Oh, and this is something like cutting out of act because medical doctor spend a lot of time uh, cutting the acts they did to the patient so that they can build the patient. So they want something from machine learning to uh, help, them, help them do that quickly. Okay. Um, from, from some disease uh, like asthma or something like that, when, when you can have several crises, you want to know uh, how long will it be till the next crisis, crisis? And if you're in the hospital, if the next crisis will come in, will, will happen in two days, perhaps it's better for you to stay in the hospital. Okay. So you want to predict early rehospitalization. Okay. So now from which data can we train this uh, AI algorithm? So there are clinical by baseline. Baseline is the data you, you know what for once at the beginning. So for example, uh, gender, ethnicity, things like that. Okay. Uh, we have genomic data. You can do genomic tests on a person. And now, and that's the, the big problem, not a problem, but it's a bit harder to, to go with it. It's what we call longitudinal uh, data, either from hospital data warehouse or from administrative electronic health data. I will give an example for the last one. But from an hospital data uh, warehouse, you can imagine when what they record from a patient. They will record all biological test results. And if you have several test results, uh, you have several records in the time. They will record medical imaging and medical reports. So you have text and at several time, as we time, and so on. So this kind of data are very, very huge. Okay, and on uh, various type. So they that a bit hard to put in the same algorithm. So for the for the last type of data, perhaps it's not very common to know that they, they exist. So I, I take the French example, but they exist in the UK, the US, and so on. So that's linked to the health insurance system. Okay, when you go to the medical doctor, you get reimbursed or you don't pay. It's the same. Yeah. So this uh, this um, information is recorded in your health insurance database. So they know when you went to the pharmacy, medical doctor, radiologist, and so on. And when you go to the, an hospital, the, the hospital will record why you go there, which type, type of uh, medical exam you undertake, and so on. And in French, we have the universal um, social security. So we have the data in the same data warehouse for all the French population. And since 2002, so that's just a, a huge amount of data. So that's what I, that's what I call administrative electronic health record because it's just for administrative uh, reimbursement uh, reason that we collect this data, but we can use this data, okay, for for machine learning. Okay, the last thing I will say on about the data is, is that you have two 
to big kinds, uh, to different kinds of data. You have what you, you can call randomized clinical trial. So you, you have a new drug and a placebo or an old drug, and you want to see which one is the best. So you will uh, get, you will recruit patients and give them the drugs uh, randomly. So that treated and untreated patients are almost, <clears throat> the two populations are almost the same. Speaking of the feature distribution, they are comparable, okay? So the, this is a good thing, but this uh, uh, RCT has, are very expensive. And so mm -hmm. they are limited to small population sizes and you don't want that in machine learning and short follow-ups, okay? And for most of them, they are not publicly available. So for ML algorithm, the, we, face, we face the problem that you have a too, um, too small uh, population size, size, so you cannot general, generalize your conclusion to the whole population, okay? And for electronic health record or what we call real life data, we have, you have very large, even sometimes exhaustive population size. It depends on the, uh, on the country and its legislation, yeah, but from uh, many countries, it's very large and long follow up. Most of the time it's publicly available, uh, at least for researchers, but you don't have the, this randomization. So if you look at a treated and an untreated population, they don't, uh, they are not comparable anymore. They don't have the same feature distribution because uh, any medical doctor would choose the treatment according to the patient con uh, clinical condition and not on one only, hopefully. Okay. So th that's a good thing because we have large population size and that's a bad thing that we have this problem. Okay. Okay, so I will speak about three algorithms that I developed with my PhD students or, or colleagues. And um, I chose these three because they all, they have the same feature, they all use a total variation penalty. So that the link between the three algorithms. So let me just say what is uh, the total variation penalty. So I have here a signal with high variability. And I will define its total variation as the sum of consecutive difference with uh, absolute value. So if it's like that, the total variation will be very large. If, if it's kind of smooth and not too, it will be smaller. And from with me, my algorithm, at one point in machine learning, you have to do optimization to get the, the value to fit the weight of your algorithm. So you have to um, <coughs> use an optimization algorithm. And in those uh, algorithms, most of the time you will uh, need to use like stochastic gradient descent. And if we have penalty, you will have to use Proxima, with proximal stochastic uh, gradient distance. So you have to be able to compute the proximal operator of your penalty, penalty in a fast way. And for this particular penalty, uh, we know that there is a fast algor algorithm developed, developed by, by Conda in 2013 that allows you to calculate this very fast. So this was my signal in light blue. If I apply the penalty with a small weight regularization term, I get the, um, the, the other blue signal. And with more regular regularization, I get the orange signal. No, no this one. This, this blue signal and the truth was the orange signal. So what's it? Why I'm interested in this total variation penalty? 
of the view that we have longitudinal data. So we have the N, the number of individuals, the P, the number of D, the number of features, that the two parameters you, you always have in machine learning. But now we have this third dimension, which is the time. Okay, so we have a lot of individual, a lot of feature, but also we have that in time. So they, they, it's like a third dimension. Okay. And I will have to enforce time stability because you cannot say something for one week and another thing the next week and so, and so on. So you want your conclusion to be stable with the time. Okay, that's why I'm gonna use this penalty. Okay, so the first algorithm, uh, it's uh, for prognostic. So uh, I have my feature and I want to uh, estimate the probability of being alive or disease free in say two years, given my feature. Okay. And in clinical practice, they love cuts off. They want to say, uh, for example, I give the well score, they want to have very simple rules. Like if you are uh, your uh, orbit of over 100, you have a high risk of pulmonary emboli uh, embolism. If it's um, if it's higher than 100, you are high risk. If it's under than 100, you are low risk. So let the, they love that because it's very quick to decide and it's very simple to understand. Okay. So, and we know that in genetic oncology study, uh, we, we have the same type of cutoff happening for very complicated biological reasons. So, uh, we, we had a look at, on the classical method to when you have a continuous feature, how you can cut it in several intervals, two or more. So, there are a lot of Literature on, on this matter. So you can do tests to find the best cuts in your feature, saying at, at what position on my feature I have the, the most different outcomes under and over this cutoff. But when you go out in this kind of reasoning, you get multiple test problems. And it's very time consuming because you have to try a lot of cut, possible cuts. So what we proposed, well, indeed, a, a lot of people, are, are, all machine learning people are, do, are doing that. So when you have a, a continuous feature like that, you will binarize it. So we will define small quantile intervals and transform your continuous feature to this kind of uh, tabular feature when I, I, when I put a one, where the initial value is here in the first column, it was on the first interval. In the, for the second uh, individual, uh, 0.3 was in the second interval, so I put a one in the second column and so on. It's called binarizing. Uh, a continuous feature and people do that all the day in all not only in medical um, as uh, machine learning problem and then we consider a, a regression with this new variable at, at inputs so we have these columns and each column has been binarized so it's transforming this line of matrix. Then you, you concatenate this matrix. So you have now a, a very large matrix with, with only one and zero. Okay. If you notice, it's larger than the initial matrix. So we have some problems because if I, if, even for one variable, if I do the sum on each row, it's going to sum to one. I have a problem on the wrong of this matrix. matrix. I don't know how to choose the number of interval. It's, it is three, four, five, six, I don't know. And I want to select only important variables. 
So what we did, we had the, the constraints saying that all the coefficients for all the work of one initial variables has to sum up to zero. And I will we introduce a, a block TV penalty. So if this penalty uh, gets a zero for one block with this constraint, all the coefficients are zero. So the variable has no influence. And what is not it, it, it we look at the mathematical part of this algorithm algorithm. And we establish this bond for our estimator, and this bonds give us uh, order of magnitude for the number of an interval we have to to consider. Okay, and this is um, our results on some of the most yeah, TCGA data that's there for with genomics feature. So this is our algorithm. This is with multi-test. This is with boosting and with a random forest. And the important feature is that our algorithm is the fastest in computing time. So we get very good results in terms of our score, and it's very fast in terms of computing time. OK, that was, that was one example. Um, the, the other one, I didn't take the time when I, I begin. So uh, about half an hour. Okay. So the the other example, um, it's for adverse event detection. So it was uh, the, an example of pharmacovigilance. So you have a drug, you can get it from the pharmacy. It has been uh, designed. It has been authorized by the health authority of your country. Well, and now it's going on the, in the world population of your country. Yeah. And for a long time, because these um, randomized clinical trials, they last like one or two years. So you don't have a, a long follow up. So now it's in the pharmacy on, on your country. And you want to be able to detect any adverse events that can come because it's going to the world population. Perhaps you didn't see some of the people in your trial, or because people will take them for a long time, longer than your trial. Like say, after five years taking this work, perhaps you will develop some something um, adverse. So, we will use for this. We will use this that administrative data set, the one with in principle all populations. So and we want so to to get from this very very weak signal because in the population for one drug, a few person use this drug or use it a long time. So, so we have very few signal weak signals. But we want to de detect possible adverse events. And then the biostatistician can do things very in by textbook uh, to verify that it was, it, it, was it a real signal or just something random. So it's not an hypothesis validation. And we need, because the data are too huge, too huge, you cannot, we cannot do biostatistic very in a good way as uh, as needed. We just want to give our algorithm all our data and enough it has to, to come up with some answers. So we work with di di diabetic patients. So, and it, uh, the, the drugs we were looking at is anti-diabetic. And the other event we were looking is data cancer. So we have 2.5 million of patients Four, four years of history, and that's the size of the, the data. So you can imagine that among these 2.5 million, uh, very few had indeed bladder cancer. But we want to see if it's linked to the anti diabetics they, they are taking. Okay. <clears throat> so for each patient, we will again split the uh, time into intervals and we will um, denote by Y 
for patient I and interval B, it's a number of adverse events. Hopefully, it's zero, but it can be one uh, for this patient I in interval B. Uh, and I is the total number of adverse ad events. And these are the longitudinal features that we observe uh, over time intervals. For us, it was mostly drug exposures. So you get a one if you take your drug in October 2009 and zero other months. And we have some baseline features, static features. I say gender, age, it can be ethnicity or something like that. So we, we are going to modelize the infinitesimal probability of having an adverse event in interval B with this kind of um, formula. I, I don't want to, to go too deep in why there is an exponential, but uh, we use lagged exposition to feature because <laughs> the, the idea was if I take a drug just now, the probability of having an adverse event in one minute was not, not, is not too high. We think that if I take this drugs every day for two years, then perhaps I will get an adverse event. So I have to look at past exposure and how long did it last. So it's why we, we put into our model these lag exposures. Okay, and doing that mathematical, mathematical, well, math, <laughs> um, it has a, a lot of consequences. And from the, we gain from the existing literature, uh, at this time, they, they were only able to consider one type of exposure of one drug uh, at uh, each time they, they train their algorithm. So they have to try for each possible drug. So it was very time consuming. And with this a new mathematical um, view of things, we were able to alleviate this thing. Okay. Then we, perhaps I will go very fast on this thing. We, we use uh, the property of Poisson processes. And the, the, the main thing, the main the main thing to understand is that you now have a multinomial distribution. We know that very well. And you have uh, this kind of quotient. And the big thing to know, the all constant effect, effects are killed. Yeah? So you don't have to worry if you don't recall them up or if you forgot some to recall, you don't get access to some of the, this constant feature, it's no way it, it will just get simplified for these questions. Okay, so this, this is a very classical machine learning algorithm. You have an empirical loss and some penalty. And then, so we run it on these um, diabetic patients. So you have insulin, metformin, other type of anti-diabetics, pubitazin, and two other anti-diabetic drugs, I don't know. So you, you see very weak signal on insulin or metformin, something like weird for the other. Well, for the pubitazin, it's okay at the beginning, and then your risk increases with time. And I don't know if you can see it, but you have this confidence interval. It's very large, but at at the end, one in that is not or zero is not in the interval anymore. So this means that these drugs as an effect of, on, on the risk of blood, blood, bladder cancer. Okay. And in fact, it was withdrawn from the French market in 2011. So that's what machine learning can do. We can uh, get all this data and just find the white drug to use it, which is responsible for this adverse effect. Okay, let me go to the last one. 
So I was talking about ter teranostics. It's a bit more complicated. It's which drugs I should give to my patient, from which he will benefit the most. <clears throat> so I was saying, I need to know if the probability of being disease-free disease in say two years is greater under treatment one or under treatment zero, if I have two treatments. If the probability is greater on the treatment one, I, I want to go to with treatment, treatment one, and otherwise I want to go to with treatment zero. Well, it's too hard for me to, to say treatment one and treatment zero, so I will say treatment and control. So the problem is in your data, you know that these individuals took treatment, a treatment or no treatment, but don't have the data for the same individual under each treatment. So the simple solution will be what we call a matching algorithm is to find. So let's say you, you get someone who, have, who has been treated. You can look into your data and, and find someone who has not been treated and who, who has the same, same feature. So it can be a, like a digital twin of the, of the first one. Okay. That's what we call matching algorithm. So there are, there are two big problems. First one is that between the treated population and the untreated population or the control population, the feature distribution is too different. So we, we, you are going to get matches and in a, in a small area of, for very, very few people. So even if you have a million people, uh, individual in your basis at the beginning, will be, you will be able to match only few of them. So you, you're losing a lot of data, data size of power, if you speak statistically. That's the first problem. And the second problem is that when you are in high dimension, you are at the same distance from, from your closer, the closest patient to the, um, the, the farthest patient. This is something in mathematics that you, we know at the curse of dimensionality. Anybody is at the same distance of anybody. So that doesn't mean anything anymore when you are in high dimension for the future. So you have to come up with other ideas than this one. So, um, in so Johansson and his colleagues, they they propose to um, to well find representation of your feature. So you will do some embeddings, okay. and you will at so you have a, something like a deep learning art, uh, architecture at, at the, the, uh, at the at last, um, yeah, at the outside, at uh, last, yeah. last uh, layer, last layer of your architecture, you want to control the last when predicting your outcome, but you want to find a representation that correct this imbalance in distribution. So you want to minimize the loss, as always, but you also want to minimize some things that measure the distance between uh, the feature for the treated and the feature for the control. Okay. Doing these two things together, you will lose a bit for the prediction task. But you will gain this uh, this feature. Will get this feature more comparable, more close between the two population. So they develop that for continuous outcomes, and the proof heavily depends on that fact because they consider least square losses and so on. So for what we wanted to do, uh, we have to adapt a lot of things. So. 
what they call the discrepancy, we use the Wasserstein distance. And for the loss, we use the loss for the, our survival outcomes that we de developed in another paper. Okay. And um, we, will, we were able, with a, with a lot of math, uh, to say that the means for the cat, the thing that is of interest, is of the under order of my loss, so my prediction loss plus my Wasserstein distance. So that we can, knowing that mathematically um, gets us to, to build our deep learning architecture because we have the output layer or the output loss. So that's it. that is uh, our result on three types, four, I cannot count in uh, four types of data uh, showing that we, we get better with us than the other for this question. Thank you a lot. Good time, thank you. <laughs> okay. Any questions, or comments, please. Uh, so the last work, uh, you try to basically compare the inference by the Mm -hmm. So you have gone through, how did you evaluate the performance? Yeah, um, these, those are semi, yeah, this is purely synthetic. This is purely synthetic and these are semi-synthetic. Okay, so people said before that uh, basically you apply the intervention that you generate the uh, outcome yeah. of something. Yeah, uh, we, gen we did that factual and counterfactual. Right. Just otherwise we cannot uh, calculate uh, compute the means. And you believe that all those assumptions hold true, right? Uh, in, in your analysis. That's why you just directly calculate. So you believe there are no confounder and so on. Yeah, for the mathematical part, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Any other? Yes, please. If you have means for structuring the, uh, the bounds in a theoretical manner, which depends on the process or on the data itself. Excuse me, yeah, you know, the, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, can we, can we structure these bounds according to the nature of the data itself or uh, how distant the features are from each other? So how do you structure these bounds? How do you find them? <laughs> I didn't put it on this, on this slide. Um, well, it, it depends on the, um, on the, that uh, feature distribution mm -hmm. and the initial distance between the uh, two distributions. And uh, we use the backliner. It depends also on the out, uh, outcome distribution. And I don't know. So there is mathematical formulation for obtaining the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were, we were, I don't know how to say it, but we were able to link this quantity yes. to the total variation and from the pink scale inequality, the total variation to the Kullback labor divergence and so on. Yeah. Um, the second part, uh, this is yes, if I call it. Um, you <coughs> mentioned briefly that uh, um, sort of a bit of the details of the, the exponentiation form of the, the model. What can you say a little bit more about yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because um, underneath there are Poisson process. Poisson process have intensity and they have to be positive. Otherwise, it doesn't mean anything. So the simplest thing to do is to put exponential of something. Right, right. Okay, that's right. the only reason. There's no right. Okay, any other questions? All right, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.